You were close. Well, crap. Looks like I missed out on another band list. Because I suck. Oh, well. It's not like they really tell us when we get a ban list, so not totally my fault. So let's do something a little different today. To better understand both of your cards and how to choose the right card decks for your decks, I'm going to be teaching you about an idea called practicality and how to enforce it so you can become a better duelist or Yu-Gi-Oh card game player. A lot of cards do the same thing, folks. Put down them decks, them dual dicks, <laughs> dual dicks, dual discs. Put down everything you got, classes in session, time to open up the notepads and pay attention. This is a lesson in practicality. First off, one of the things that makes the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game interesting to a bunch of people is the huge variety of cards in the overreaching 9,000 plus card pool. Sure, Magic and Pokemon have technically been around for much longer and have huge card pools, but the thing that Yu-Gi-Oh! does than most other competitive trading card games is enforcing what's called set rotation. Set rotation is essentially the idea that from one date until the announced end date, within a certain year, usually six months to almost a whole 12 months, any cards released within those dates you're allowed to use in a sanctioned tournament. Competitive play. Anything else that's not within that time frame, uh, not to so much. This not only inclines you to buy the newest set, but pseudo acts as a way to balance modern competitive play. Whereas you don't end up with one deck or combo that interacts with these older cards and breaks the entire competitive meta as a whole. This difference in ideologies between Yu Gi Oh! and how most other card games want you to play it competitively is often seen by the card pool itself. Is the card available in this region where you play? And is it on the ban list? Yes and no? Well, that's the only level or entry required for your deck in the competitive play of Yu-Gi-Oh! So, of course, with set rotation not existing, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, it makes it a little more unique, I'm sure people who are used to a set rotation, maybe not to so much, but a variety of cards that almost do the exact same thing are often printed in these sets. This creates this sort of discrepancy in the practicality of both certain cards and the players that use them. Hence today's example, which is going to help me teach you how to understand what practicality is and decide for yourself what is practical for your deck. My example, which I have dubbed the classic example, Sakuretsu Armor versus Mirror Force. But before a practicality lesson, let me take you to a real quick history lesson. Considering how much history likes to repeat itself, especially in this modern day and age, I'd say this is relatively important. So listen up, kiddies. Once upon a time, Mirror Force was actually one of the most powerful trap cards in the game. Downright banned at some points, otherwise it would pretty much be limited. You only ever really allowed one copy. If you ever play against a friend, well, pretend you have some, and you're about to lose, you got an open board, no monsters, but you might have some spell and trap cards set. Just when they're ready to pounce you for game, you notice that one of their monsters is in defense, or you just notice that they, just before they attack you, they'll slide it in defense. That is a man that has been driven insane by the abundance of Mirror Force for game he's had to endure. Because attacking into the Mirror Force once upon a time could very well mean you just lost right then and there. It was that crazy. Hell, I remember even during the GX era, this card was nigh impossible to obtain, or even fine, unless you were willing to pay the high price cap. So, either you were old enough at the time to make your own money, and you could just buy one, or for those more luckier than me, and I have to imagine most children at that age, had mommy's money. Or, of course, they had an older brother who not only played and taught them how to play the game, but could obtain these cards for them. So, when Sakuretsu Armor was released, and at a lower rarity to Mirror Force around this time, this is what me and I have to imagine a lot of other younger players had available to them. Three Sakuretsu armor. This fact, and considering at the time Mirror Force was limited, Sakuretsu armor, I will fully admit, did serve its purpose for the time in which it was released. As a watered down and hypothetically more balanced Mirror Force, in a time when Mirror Force was one copy per deck, and some players might have desperately needed to substitute, such as myself. Sakuretsu armor reads, When an opponent's monster declares an attack, target the attacking monster. Destroy that target. Mirror Force reads, When an opponent's monster declares an attack, destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters. Now, both are cards that tactically destroy an opponent's monster that tries to attack you. First thing to know is when the card can 
pretty much activate. Which is any time when your opponent is attacking you. Specifically when they're saying they're going to attack declaration. Now of course if you're anyone literary you probably already figured out that Sakuretsu armor hits one monster while Mirror Force hits potentially five. Now with the new extra monster zone now six cards on your opponent's side of the field. If they're in attack mode of course. So class over, right? Like it's very obvious which is the better card, which is more practical. Nah, sit back down. I got more for you. There's more that makes Sakuretsu armor a little less practical that you should probably understand. So sit down. Starting off with this word right here, target. Targeting is a very specific action in this game that forces the person that's using a card to target something before it can pretty much resolve. You activate Sakuretsu armor and before the monster is even destroyed, you have to target that said monster that's attacking him. Any card text that specifically states that it does not target or it basically won't have the word targeted at all, resolves without doing so. And you might think that that might not make a difference, but it does. A lot of cards, especially now, are downright unaffected by stuff, pretty much. And even before that, we had a lot of cards that didn't allow them to be targeted, meaning Sakuretsu armor was twice as useless against anything that states it cannot be targeted against. It just doesn't work. Overall, making the Sakuretsu armor even less practical than Mirror Force. Mirror Force doesn't target, so the viability with these is really night and day. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've had this video lesson on the back burner for a while, using this to set example, but to be perfectly honest with you, I thought it would be way too short because it's really all I had to say about it. Because it's really obvious as to which card is the better one. I didn't really have an example that could really teach you how to be more practical with your choices than Mirror Force vs. Sakuretsu Armor. I mean, there just isn't enough subjectivity to vouch for one over the other in any deck at all. But some recent news about a card in Ignition Assault the next set. Pretty much we're getting Chaos Impact sneak peek this weekend. So by three months from now, this is a card that will be coming out called Catch Copy. Now, when I read this card, I immediately remembered it had some striking resemblance to another certain card. Released a couple years ago, a little while back, and it's definitely seen some competitive play. Shared Ride. Shared Ride. For the rest of this turn, each time a card is added from the main deck or graveyard to your opponent's hand, except by drawing them of course, you immediately draw one card. You can only activate one shared ride per turn. Catch Copy If your opponent adds a card from the decks to the hands by their card effect, except by drawing it, reveal one card in your deck. And if you do, add it to your hand. But you cannot activate cards or the effect of cards with that name for the rest of this turn. Now this example may not be the most subjective either, but it gives me way more to talk about. Most of the time you're probably going to tech in Shared Ride, but there are exceptions to this, starting off with that direct search. Shared Ride acts as sort of a max C, where as long as your opponent keeps fulfilling the actions of adding cards from their deck to their hand, or the graveyard to their hand, you can just skim the top cards of your deck. Cat's Copy gets you a specific card, one specific card, and you reveal it to your opponent. Would you rather have more cards? A lot of decks, sure. I mean, more cards means more resources, right? But in certain decks, you don't really have time to hope that you draw into your key cards you need to win. A prime example of this will always be Exodia. Playing an Exodia deck, you need to blow through your deck as quickly as possible, or likely with the mine, hard stall your opponent while your deck does what it does and collects Exodia pieces. So an Exodia deck might opt for this card over Shared Ride, because it is a direct surge rather than relying on the fickleness of Shared Ride, where yes, it could tactically give you a plus one at the clay, but only if your opponent doesn't opt to stop searching for the remainder of their turn, which if you activate Shared Ride, they very well might. In this case, the specific search would be infinitely better than skimming the random top card of your deck and even the potential of plussing, especially if it brings you that much closer to your win condition. Also, random thing to note about this card, the way it's worded is interesting. Adds a card from the decks to the hands. To my understanding, this means that Cat's Copy can be activated if they put cards from your deck to your hand, which is, uh... Uh, interesting, but seriously, don't expect your opponent to give you stuff. Unless it's benefiting them in the long run, d d just don't expect that. Something we also have to consider is that Cat's Copy is a trap. Shared Ride is a quick play spell, thereby making Cat's Copy a tad slower because you have to set it first. 
Forest, where Shared Ride can be activated from the hand during your turn. Cat's Copy doesn't allow you to use the cards you search for in the same turn, while Shared Ride does. So if you draw into your hand trap, well guess what? You can maxi on top of a maxi effect, which is kind of dumb, I'm not gonna lie. Cat's Copy, not to so much. But then again, if you're using Cat's Copy to search for stuff, you're very likely not searching for hand traps to begin with. You're searching for that card that's going to lead you to GG's. Shared Ride is also a hard once per turn. Cat's Copy isn't. Cat's Copy can be activated multiple times in one turn. So it's kind of like the Reckless Greed idea where you probably want to main deck three of them and you want to use all three of them at once. But I mean, you could just draw into one of them and it would be just as beneficial to you. These are the things that you have to consider and understand when choosing which cards work best for your deck. Especially cards that have very similar effects. These are the determining factors that help you weigh out what is the most practical card and or effect for your deck. Something that I find especially new players tend to have a problem with. Would you believe me if I actually told you within the last three years, I've gone on to sites like Dueling Book and have faced people who are playing things as Sakuretsu armor? And keep in mind, Mirror Force has been at 3 4 feels like a lifetime at this point in 2019. I find that in Yu-Gi-Oh it's very hard for new and or returning players, especially, especially if they've had some history with watching the anime, to be able to distinguish between good effects and outdated ones. Oftentimes their ruling and memory of the card pool only reached to a specific time period, that time period where their involvement in Yu-Gi-Oh was at its highest, and what all their friends were into and the rulings they understood about the game. Fortunately I didn't have any friends playing this game when I was growing up, so I got the suck at Yu-Gi-Oh alone. Of course, this leads to an ultimate problem because Yu-Gi-Oh is a card game that's always changing. And that often leads to this disconnect between both the rules and what newer cards have outpower crept what. As if most of us ever really read the rule book. But you know what? At least I'm the type that will admit that I didn't. 